Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to our weekly discussion series, uh, which is hosted by the Chaldean Cultural Center in collaboration with the University of Michigan Detroit Center, Unique Voices in Films, a nonprofit organization, and CMN TV, which will replay this episode um, on their channels, Channel 18 um, and WOW and Comcast. Uh, today, I have two guests. Uh, they are members of the Iraqi and American Reconciliation Project, Dr. Uh, Azar Maluki and Kathy McKay. Welcome to our program. Thank you, Lorraine. Thank you. And uh, we're very excited to have them because they have, uh, they are part of an organization that helps basically do what it says is to reconcile Iraqi and Americans. And uh, I've been following uh, you guys' organization for many years. You've done amazing projects, which we'll discuss today. But first, I kind of wanted to just uh, learn a little bit about each one of your backgrounds and see how you guys got involved with this organization. Uh, so Dr. Azar. Thank you, Ian, and uh, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Azar Maloki. I am a physician uh, from Iraq. Um, I am a former professor at the University of Kufa in my hometown, Najaf. Um, Najaf is kind of my hometown city. It is about 100 miles south of the capital, Baghdad. Um, uh, I uh, actually uh, traveled to the United States with my family in, in 2015 and uh, joined the University of Minnesota as a research fellow uh, uh, from that time uh, until recently. Uh, actually, uh, I've been involved with the Iraqi and American uh, Reconciliation Project for the year of 2008, uh, since I was in, in Najaf. And uh, uh, at that time, actually, it was something surprising that we heard of an American people uh, who uh, initiated this uh, this group, uh, this uh, peacemaker group, uh, after the uh, devastation that happened to the Iraqi society and Iraqi families as a, as a result of the of the war at that time. So it was really um, uh, exciting project. So I decided to uh, to join the activities of the IRB in in, uh, in Iraq. And the first of, uh, of these activities was uh, actually uh, a form of humanitarian project where the IRB supplied ir uh, Iraqi schools in Najaf with uh, water filtration systems and other uh, basic needs uh, for healthy water and, and other basic needs for Iraqi students. Um, so I got uh, excited uh, to participate more and more in this uh, organization and um, Later on, I participated uh, in the uh, exchange professional visits uh, supervised by the IRB that happened between uh, uh, the two cities of Najaf in Iraq and Minneapolis in the United States. And so I visited uh, the twin cities uh, twice in 2011 and 2013. Uh, after I uh, relocated with my family in the United States in Minnesota, it becomes more easy to me to follow the IRB projects and participate more uh, deeply in these uh, projects uh, until I was elected as a board chair in uh, last October uh, 2020 uh, as a board chair of the organization. So this started um, by an American uh, community. Is would that happen to be you, Kathy? <laughs> well, I, I'm one of of several people um, who, you know, after America invaded Iraq, we were horrified and felt badly and followed things, and um, you know, didn't feel like we had didn't feel like there was anything we could do. Uh, but eventually, we met meeting together for a while. We came up with an idea, and there was an Iraqi American who, um, after Saddam went away, he moved back to Iraq from the Twin Cities, and so he was a good connection for us. And that's um, so we started with the fundraising in this country for water filters, and as Azar mentioned, we're able to the water filters were purchased from a local business, per, small business person in Najaf and then installed by a local person. So we like the idea of, you know, using local business people 
and funding them and everything. So we did that for about a hundred different schools, I think, over a period of about three years. And and the other thing that started happening was um, inviting delegations of Iraqi professionals to come and visit. And we had several delegations, as I mentioned, a couple. Many of them were professionals, doctors and engineers and lawyers and uh, they would come for two weeks and stay in people's homes. So the longtime Minnesotans really got an opportunity to talk with Iraqis, meet Iraqis, have them in their homes, do things together. And then, you know, we did projects around around the Twin Cities and met with people at the University of Minnesota and the medical school and created things that the visitors were interested in learning about in America. So someplace along there, I think in 2007, <clears throat> we incorporated as a nonprofit, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, didn't really have, a, have money exactly to be a, an official organization, but we kind of worked out of our homes. And, and early on, we had a lot of interest from young people who were studying Arabic in some of the local colleges that wanted to volunteer and do internships with us. So really it was a lot of young people who built the initial infrastructure of the organization and allowed us to kind of hold things together you know as an entity uh, so that was and it was a group of probably 20 people originally and then when we formalized into a board there was maybe seven or eight came on the board it was all uh, longtime minnesotans and, you know, we'll get into this more, but as we've transitioned now, the board is um, over 50% Iraqis and the, the, really the direction and the, <clears throat> the force, the momentum of the organization is, is um, on Iraqi voices now, which is just great. And all of it is helps, uh, you know, long time Minnesotans learn about it. And way back in the beginning, we used to say, um, you know, Americans just think Iraqis are terrorists. And the Iraqis would say, we only think Americans have military uniforms and come to our front doors. So we're really a, a long ways from that. And um, anyway, we'll talk more about details. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you for the, the work and the idea of creating this because uh, as an Iraqi American myself, I was born in Baghdad and, and raised in America, but when the war did happen and um, even when I visited Iraq in 2000, I did get the sense where there's so much misunderstanding and misconceptions about both people. And uh, Iraqis are oftentimes, it's just that, you know, they're always associated with um, you know, the, the religion, the, you know, just uh, Islam, terrorism, and Saddam. <laughs> and, you know, and there's no story past that. And it's hard to see them as people beyond um, that description that's played out in the media. So uh, the stuff that you have done, you know, you have three main programs that um, you focus on, including, which I, I love that there's so much um, arts and culture in your projects and programs. One is the Iraqi Art Project, uh, Humanitarian Projects for Peace, uh, People to People. There's also um, the Iraqi Voices. And if you can just tell us a little bit about um, some of these programs and which ones are currently active, which ones are on hold because of the pandemic, um, if some have, you know, had to uh, change because, to, you know, hmm. accommodate the pandemic, um, and which ones people can actually participate in and how. Okay, well, do you want to start answering on some of these questions? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be glad to, to discuss that. Actually, the IRB works on a, an, uh, an important and uh, common goal, which is uh, creating reconciliation and a friendship between uh, people and communities of Iraq and the United States. And we achieve this big goal through three main streams, um, actually, uh, or three main uh, projects. Uh, humanitarian projects for peace and people to people project and Iraqi art project. And each one of these big projects include um, uh, many campaigns and many uh, actually efforts, personal and organizational efforts uh, that had succeeded in accomplishing the basic needs of Iraqi people and also in creating some sort of understanding uh, between the cultures of the two countries. Um, regarding the uh, humanitarian projects, actually we worked on um, 
uh, different uh, items, uh, including, for example, uh, water filtration uh, systems provided to uh, schools in Najaf. About eight, uh, 80 to 100 schools were supplied by these uh, water filtration systems and also providing dignity and hygiene kits to Iraqi displaced people inside Iraq in the areas of conflict after the occupation of some territories in Iraq by, uh, by ISIS. And also the big campaign in this, um, in this arm is the box for Mosul. Actually, we happily uh, uh, confirm that we were able to uh, rebuild the, the University of uh, Mosul library and supplying it with major books. And as you know, the library of the University of Mosul was burned to the ground uh, after the occupation of the city uh, by ISIS. And we were able to uh, raise um, uh, a book for Mosul drive to rebuild the library and resupply it with the uh, basic needs of books uh, and other important uh, things. And in this aspect, we were able to supply the library by about 15,000 books and we raised almost $15,000 that we used for, uh, for the cost of shipping and other handling uh, uh, procedures. Uh, on another aspect also regarding the people-to-people uh, -people project, we were able to uh, communicate uh, students in both countries in Iraq and the US through uh, letters for peace students in each country wrote a letters for peace and described their emotions and, and a sense of friendship and a sense of humanity in these letters. And it was a great thing actually. And also we were able to achieve um, many community gatherings between the American and Iraqi Minnesotans living uh, here actually uh, on different occasions in the form of picnics and other social gather, uh, gatherings. And also Iraq was active through the Iraqi cultural booth in the annual event of the Festival of Nation. Uh, that was an annual um, uh, carnival happening in the Twin Cities every year until the, the pandemic, of course, when everything get, uh, get changed uh, because of the medical restrictions. Uh, and also we held uh, many interfaith dialogue group and women's friendship uh, groups uh, and the main uh, project in this field, in the People to People project, was actually signing a sister city project between the two cities of Najaf in Iraq and Minneapolis uh, in the US. And that was a great achievement, actually. This uh, project was signed in 2010-2011, uh, and uh, it permits the professional exchange of delegates from Iraq to the US uh, and also uh, from the US to Iraq, which happened in 2012. I think Kathy will talk in more detail about that. Um, the other, uh, uh, actually, uh, uh, project that we worked on uh, was the art uh, project or the Iraqi art project. Uh, the idea about the Iraqi project is to, is to present an Iraqi and American visual art, films, theater, stories, uh, to make a more uh, intimate rapport between the two uh, cultures uh, and the people of the two countries actually. And of importance in this Iraqi art project was the Iraqi Voices Lab, which we started in 2012 uh, and it continued till 2017. Uh, in this uh, project, actually, the Iraqi Voices Ab, there was a collaborative art uh, project that gave Minnesotan Iraqi immigrants and refugees the uh, possibility of doing what we call an artistic platform to share their stories, to share their ideas, and to express themselves also as individuals and as a community. Um, regarding the Iraqi Voices Lab, we were able to publish nine books and produce 14 short films between 2012 and 2016. And um, I actually myself produced a short film uh, uh, during this period. And also we were able uh, to perform a big theater act, which was uh, entitled Birds Sing Differently Here. And it was a 
great, actually a great event at that time. It, it brought a lot of sense, a lot of emotions between Iraqis and Americans. And it was very welcomed in different areas uh, of Minnesota. So that was um, uh, a rapid overview or a short overview of, of what we are doing at the IRB. Yeah, good, good, good overview, uh, Azar. I could say a couple of things that I've been involved with of those of what Azar mentioned, William, if, unless you have uh, some other questions. No, that's great. I, I'm waiting to, direction. To, yeah, to add on to that. Well, um, I was a member of one of the women's groups. We've had, I think, maybe three women's groups. And the way they're designed is we make a commitment to meet. And there, was, there were six or seven longtime Minnesota women and six or seven Iraqi women. And we made a commitment to meet once a month for a year. <clears throat> and we met in one another's homes sometimes. And of course, as soon as we met in an Iraqi woman's home, there was so much food and so much wonderful <laughs> food. So then the American women said, oh, we can't just have cookies and coffee. So then it got to be a big food fest and kind of ended at the end of the year at a, so at a woman's house over the, holiday, the Christmas holidays. Her house was all decorated. And so we met in homes. And the other thing we did was went to different, different sites around the Twin Cities. And as um, Jamila, one of the Iraqi women said, we want to go places that American women our age like to go. So we had a tour of the state capitol and we went to the Rose Gardens and we you know, went out to some of the lakes and did things like that together. So that, uh, that was wonderful. And you know, we are all um, lightly in touch via Facebook or at our big events. As I mentioned, we've had a big picnic in, the, in September every year until this year where we have live music and everyone brings food. So there's Iraqi food and non-Iraqi food. And the Americans say, what is American food? <laughs> Other than hamburgers, everything else is from another country. So that's, anyway, that's an example of the women's group. Then there was another, we met for a year and then another group started up and then a young mother's group started up which was um, a young Iraqi women with their young infants and preschool children and American women with their young children. And sometimes they'd bring the kids and it was pretty chaotic, but it still, it was another <laughs> sharing, you know. So that would be under people to people. And as I mentioned, the Festival of Nations um, and, and we had a young artist, Iraqi artist, young man, made a beautiful replica of the Gate of Ishtar. And their 80 countries had a booth representing their countries and the Iraqi booth won that year. It was so gorgeous. And, and the uh, local Iraqi staffed the booth, which was like from nine until nine at night for four days. And um, sometimes wore traditional clothing and did you know lots of education it's common for schools to bring busloads of kids come in from all around the state really to go to the festival of nations so thousands of of kids go through on thursday and friday and then it's open to the public on the weekend and lots of people so lots of people saw real iraqis you know and talked to them and that was it i think oh I and we, that, I'm, I'm sorry go ahead well, uh, just one other thing under the people, the people we, we didn't had an Ishtar dinner for several years in which we weren't able to do during the pandemic, but I think maybe three years. And we did it a little differently, different times. We had it catered from a local Middle Eastern restaurant the last time, and it was hosted by a big Lutheran church in suburban Minneapolis. And the ministers were there and welcomed everyone. And then we had an imam came and did a little mini lecture on what Ishtar and Ramadan, you know. Um, and I think we had about a hundred people there. And people, we encourage people to mix it up at the tables, you know, don't just sit with your friends. And that's something we, I think, will continue to do each year during Ramadan after the pandemic. I, I love um, your description of the, the women groups. I think that is uh, amazing because I too, uh, one of the ways that I felt is, is um, important for people to get to know each other after seeing the stereotypes and you know, rather than kind of complain about it and just kind of focus on it, 
So what I would do is just, it was so easy for me to invite uh, my colleagues over for dinner. That was, mm-hmm. the, for us, it's just so much fun to serve and to serve our foods. And it's just not, not just because of the way that we honor guests, but it was also just, um, it's fun, like uh, Iraqi mm-hmm. women cook. But the relationships that were started from people coming into your homes, I think sometimes it's just as simple as that. You invite people to your homes, they invite you to their homes and you go. <laughs> mm-hmm. And that's how relationships are formed. And, and the way you were describing it, I could just envision it, especially the one with the mothers and allowing the kids, because that's another part of our um, life. And, our, you know, we're very tribal in the sense that we have, we have kids and we have um, extended families. And this is just how we operate under mm-hmm. the kids and with the food. So you've really touched on the authenticity of Iraqis and tried to kind of create a, an intimate way of connection outside of just the other programming that's often done between other countries. So to, I think the intimacy is very important because that's really where it touches people's hearts and they don't see it only on an artificial way or in a distant way that really touches home. So that, that's a beautiful program um, that I'm sure, like, is it? Is it kind of, I don't, you said like you guys kind of connect remotely, but uh, it's, it's something that I would love to see. And, and if I was living there, I'd probably, I, not probably, I'd for sure participate. In a group. <laughs> yeah. I, would, I would get involved in that group. Um, so, so, so you mentioned some of the ways that the pandemic has affected, um, you know, some of the programs, but how about regarding some of the political situation that has happened over the years? Has that kind of had any kind of an effect or are you still able to just focus? It seems like most of the work that you do is not really, um, I mean, it's not because if it's politically driven or not, but just like the delegates coming here and, and vice versa, is that an issue or not really? Well, now it's a big issue since Trump came in, no one can get a visa in Iraq. Okay. And um, we had one, I mean, an, a lot of bad situations, you know, that we don't have too much <clears throat> power to do too much with other than to provide a place for people to talk about things and brainstorm ideas and, you know, sometimes we would set up meetings with the local senator's office to try and and get a, a, a many asylum cases are on hold. <clears throat> People don't know what's going to happen with that. One of our board members, actually, his wife had gone to Baghdad to visit her grandchildren when Trump dropped the Muslim ban. And um, was it he was gone or she was? One of them was gone anyway, and the Muslim ban, and they were afraid they couldn't get back in the country even, you know. Uh, and many of the local relatively recent immigrants have adult children and grandchildren in Iraq they can't see, you know, they haven't been able to visit. Um, so it's, it's a big problem. Everyone. So that did create some kind of a stress in the situation. And then, um, so your focus kind of shifted and we're trying to help people kind of communicate and express themselves because they couldn't come here, you know, well, you know, it's funny, that's kind of a, maybe a hidden um, outcome of the pandemic is getting more comfortable with virtual things and with Zoom things. <clears throat> We've done, um, we have a current photography show that's still up that has a very nice virtual tour that people can do. And we are pushing that on Facebook and hoping, you know, maybe people in Iraq can go see the, the art show. We, and we had an opening um about six weeks ago it was all, pretty much all outside and but we had live music and at, the chairs were all distanced and the food was all pre-packaged in small packages and uh, we think don't you think as there maybe 175 people came and went for the afternoon it was a beautiful day luckily and um so that's still available i agree i want to uh, yeah I don't... Yeah, around 200 people actually attend that event. And um, uh, we can say proudly that the, I, uh, the IRB, although it is a small organization, but we continued our operations um, despite the big impact of the pandemic. Uh, we continue our support to Iraqi people. We continue our uh, major operations. We continue our meetings, board meetings, and uh, uh, we initiated this uh, photography home of memories event uh, from October 10th till December 12th. And we did uh, a big in-person opening at that time 
uh, as Kathy said, when about 200 people attended the event and uh, shared everybody with food, with live music, with different activities, with ice cream. And it was a big community gathering actually to practice again normal life in the, in the middle of the pandemic. So that was just great. So that was going to be my next question. Like, how can people get involved um, these days? You know, the, and you're right. Um, the pandemic, you know, there, of course, there are so many of the negatives. But one of the things it has allowed us to connect to people that otherwise we wouldn't, such as yourselves. You know, we had we were more like local and doing programming locally. And then when this happened, we've ended up meeting so many wonderful people and been able to touch base with them because there's no more like there's no borders between us. There's like the internet. <laughs> And uh, yeah. allows for us to share our stories. Um, but how can people get involved? Like, where where should they go? What, what can they get involved with? Uh, you have you said you have Facebook um, up that shows. Yeah, our Facebook account is pretty active. Ours are more more competent Facebook than yeah. I am. But we, we put thing. We have a lot of it. We put information out and you know add things a couple times a week at least and. The, the opening was live streamed on our Facebook page. What else would you say about? Actually, we are, uh, we are very active on social media, especially Facebook, Instagram, and to a lesser extent on Twitter. But mostly we are very active on Facebook. We do posting like every other day and we update people actually about different things, not, not only about IRB activities, but about the medical impact of the pandemic, for example. We just posted, I think yesterday, or this day early morning, uh, a video from the uh, Minnesota Department of Health educating people about the uh, safer practices uh, in, uh, in the COVID pandemic. So in Arabic. Are, yeah, in Arabic, yeah. So we are following up with people, with our uh, communities on that. We are not uh, separated from them in any way. We continue our effort, we continue uh, applying for grants, and we continue getting funded, fortunately. Uh, so uh, life is still going, although in a, in a reduced capacity, but we are still uh, doing our best to reach people everywhere. That's wonderful. It's wonderful to hear that. And um, we only have a few minutes. So just, I guess, you know, if you could each um, share some last words about what, what message, you know, you want to put out there, especially like, why is this work still important? And why should um, Iraqis and Americans still work on having uh, a relationship? Well, it's been a really rich experience for me. Um, I did get to go visit. Seven of us went for two weeks to Najaf, and we traveled to Babylon and some other surrounding cities, and we had a wonderful time. We, we were hosted by the governor of Najaf province in a small castle that had been one of Saddam's getaway castles. <laughs> we each had our own room and looking right, over, right out over the Euphrates, and... Um, it was a wonderful trip. I won't go into all the details, but um, I mean, it's, you know, hopefully we will influence our legislators and there'll be a, like a ripple effect from normalizing relationships locally between Iraqis and longtime Minnesotans. It will just carry out uh, so that people aren't so afraid and so weird, and, you know, so that I mean, my goal would be that our foreign relations becomes one of, you know, friends working together yes. rather than the suspicion and hostility and, you know, edginess that uh, the U.S. State Department seems to still have towards Iraq. Yeah. Yeah, uh, actually, yeah I have a mission for everybody uh, from the point of IRB. I'm asking everybody not to judge people from a distance. And instead, they should share food, should share their life with everyone before uh, judging people from a distance. Um, we are talking about tolerance, about understanding, about mutual respect. And these are not purely political things that we are working on. These are actually uh, uh, human uh, instincts that we should uh, exaggerate in ourselves from, from the inside of ourselves. So, so this is important on the personal level, not only on the, on the political level. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I think one thing we'll take for sure, aside from 
uh, all the beautiful examples of what your work has been, but that just really us sharing um, an invitation to each other's home, something as simple as that. Sometimes, you know, we don't have to be, uh, I mean, that's just a great example of what you described the women's connecting that way. And, you know, it's just so beautiful. So thank you uh, for joining us. Good luck, best of luck with all the projects that you do. And we look forward to having you again when you have um, new projects and new um, ideas to share. Thank you. Thank you, Liam. Thank you very much, the Caldean Center. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Bye, everybody.